Hello and welcome to the Stories of Innovation, a podcast by World Vision International Nepal. I'm your host, Utsav Karel. In this podcast, we talk about the e-commerce and the sharing economy. And in this episode, we have got really fantastic guest, Rohit Tiwari, who is the CEO of Hamro Bazaar, which is the first online marketplace in Nepal. Prior to joining Hamro Bazaar, Rohit was co-founder of Food Mario, which is an innovative platform that allows people to cook and sell through the application, as well as someone to order home-cooked food. For this reason, he was also awarded Forbes 30 Under 30. In this episode, we'll be talking about the role of e-commerce in building local ecosystem, as well as the promises of sharing economy. So, Rohit, welcome to Stories of Innovation. Thank you so much. Uh, since we talk about stories and innovation, I, I think like let, let's start with talking about your journey as an entrepreneur, as someone who has been innovating quite a lot and people are really inspired by you. So, okay, what is the story behind Rohit, behind Hamra Bazaar, behind Food Mario, all the cool things you are doing so far? Yeah, uh, I'll start with keeping it very brief uh, on mm -hmm. Food Mario was something that I started on th in 2017. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hamra Bazaar is a company that I didn't start. I'm leading it as a CEO. Mm -hmm. But Hamra Bazaar does have a story. It started in 2005, I think. Uh, that's the very early stage of when uh, the internet penetration that we have today is much higher. But in 2005, it was the ADHL connection that we were using, most of us. And uh, my own journey, it started, I think it was 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, I was studying engineering and uh, uh, during that time, uh, it wasn't entrepreneurship that um, I was thinking ki, uh, I just wanted to do something that makes money right. and uh, something that it give, gives me a sense of excitement. And this is where I started uh, my informal ventures in college. Uh, so the first thing that I started, I think, um, while studying engineering was with a group of my friends. Uh, it was a magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called... Uh, Electrocom, uh, it, it meant electronics and communication in sort. Right, that was the <laughs> cool thing, right? <laughs> True. Yeah, so it was, it was the entire class which was involved in it and it was uh, eight pieces of a magazine or some, something in between, like it was half of a magazine, half of a newspaper. And we, uh, we thought that it, it's going to work, it's going to be with us for the entire life and we're going to make a lot of money out of right. this magazine. Uh, but then eventually we just published one of the publication, it just went out with a one version of it. We couldn't continue it. And uh, soon after realizing the failure with that magazine, uh, I still wanted to do something. So I started um, selling rice to my college canteens. Right. Uh, the, the entire idea was that we, we used to go to a place called Ramari Daiko Fried Rice Kanito. Right. And uh, uh, the idea that if, we, if the guy is selling so much of rice, there shouldn't be a demand. So I got connected with one of uh, my brothers. He was, um, I think he was getting uh, rice uh, from Butwell or somewhere. So I just was the middleman in between and wanted to sell this rice to the college canteen and other dif different places. But then again, like uh, it wasn't, uh, it didn't go as planned. Right. So there were a lot of different things that we wanted to do. We, we did a, a two days um, big concert on, in college uh, it involved not just concert, but a national level cycling competition. Uh, I don't know, like the uh, robotics competition. Right. There were a lot of things involved in these two days. Uh, realizing that how difficult is, it is to get sponsorship for an event. And eventually, uh, by end of my engineering, the final final uh, year, uh, I was selling LED lights in 2011. Right. Uh, 11, 11, 12. Uh, it was a very new thing for Nepali market. So... Um, I got connected to a few people who were importing LED lights. Mm -hmm. I knew there was a demand. Right. So um, I was selling 10,000, 20,000 LED lights um, in a week, in in a month. And the realization that LED lights were selling because we wanted to save a lot of electricity. And these lights easily worked on small inverters as well. Uh, there was a big potential for solar energy. So uh, by end of my engineering, I formally registered a company in 2012 uh, called Active Technology with a friend who had just returned from uh, UK uh, uh, studying as CA uh, because it was a visible market. We had like 18 hours of load setting at that point of time. So this is where the journey started formally. Right. So 
I, I was just trying to reflect, you know, like uh, you went to the engineering school, right? Not a business school. <laughs> no. And you were entrepreneur every time, right? You started with a magazine, like the typical business people do, right? So we're you really studying engineering or you were doing business most of the time? I mean, the sense of uh, excitement that a transition would right. bring or uh, a new thing that you would want to, where you can pour in your energy or your creativity into was something that was exciting me. Uh, it wasn't uh, exactly, I would say, as a, a, a proven business model that I was following because I wasn't into a business school. I had no idea of the theories right. and the finance and credit, debit or anything else. It was basically engineering that we were studying, but uh, the excitement was coming from somewhere else. Absolutely. Because uh, I, I think one of the best thing or the beauty of engineers is they think differently, right? Like a lot of iteration goes, uh, sure. a lot of, you know, like trial and error goes. And that's why, like, we are getting a different kind of business model, which are very unique, very innovative and stuff. So uh, that, 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 that's, you know, like uh, amazing. You started from something and you had the whole journey and then you had the clear idea that I'm going to change something. I want to create a value, which is really fantastic. And I'm sure like that's how the Food Mario came. Like what was the aha moment or the Eureka moment for Food Mario? Like how did that yeah. come across? So. Uh after after uh, my engineering, I was involved in a few more businesses. And eventually in 2017, I was like, uh, maybe I'm doing a lot, but it doesn't mean I'm doing things rightly. So maybe these companies are not scaling. Right. Uh, some of the companies did really well. Uh, my solar company was doing well, but uh, eventually we uh, saw no scope for it as the electricity uh, were redeemed in a mm -hmm, country. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, I used to have tried a couple of more businesses around agriculture and a few more ventures, but something was not working well. So I attended a boot camp. Right. Uh, it was called Udhimi Seed Camp. Mm -hmm. And while going to the boot camp, I actually had a different idea at that point of time. It was called Engineers for Nepal. All right. Uh, it was a platform where we would want to connect uh, we wanted to connect a lot of engineering talent to uh, people who wanted engineering talent. Uh, and this this would be done through an uh, algorithm that would be very efficient. So people could figure out was the, who are the right uh, engineering candidates for the purpose of work they wanted to do. Right. But by end of it, it, it was a platform. Engineer, Engineers for Nepal was a platform. By end of that uh, particular boot camp, I met a couple of my mentors where we uh, talked about different spaces um, of innovation where how the world is moving forward and uh, uh, what are the businesses which are doing globally really well. And during this conversation, we talked about food tech companies mm -hmm. uh, in our neighboring countries like Jomato, Swiggy, uh, a couple of more companies in um, Middle East and Europe and U.S., we were scaling very rapidly as mm -hmm. the internet penetration had gotten up and uh, a lot of people didn't have enough time to uh, cook by themselves. So uh, food tech was something that was being built up. So I just, uh, after having this conversation, we, uh, I, I went back to my home. I was just thinking around it. Uh, there were already companies in Nepal who were doing fairly, fairly good and uh, in food tech spectrum. Uh, these were delivery companies we, we would connect uh, restaurants and uh, customers. Uh, and it seemed like a space where there can be more players in uh, to just uh, uh, bring the growth that was needed to the sector. But I, I didn't just want to start something else that would uh, directly compete against uh, the existing players. So just thinking around it, uh, there was a thought on... Uh, if the kitchen that we have in homes can be utilized to uh, cater to a wider market right. or, or a lot of people. So just thinking about it, uh, at that point of time, I was, I was realizing the fact that uh, we spend so much of money to build kitchens. I right. mean, like it, 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 not just the build up, but the land itself, like right. uh, real estate is very expensive. So much of a space, so less utilized, and uh, it just used thrice or f like four times a day. And then in particular, our subcontinent, uh, people who were born, I would say, before 80s, uh, they preferred to stay at home. Right. And the primary skill that they had accumulated over 20, 30, 
40 years of their life was cooking for their family, friends, relatives, when people would gather. And they were mostly appreciated for the food that they made. Absolutely. And just thinking around it then, it just made sense to create a platform where their expertise, their experience of 20, 30, 40 years, and the availability of kitchen and the comfort of their home could mm-hmm. bring a financial independence to them as well right. and create a wider market to them. At the same time, it could cater to a big community of people or a big crowd of customers who wanted to have good, healthy, uh, reasonably less expensive food at the offices or at the dinner home in different places. So this is how I started a Facebook group. All right. Uh, it was called uh, Let's Let's Talk Food Nepal. The right. only purpose of that group was not to sell, but to showcase on uh, what they have made at home, to share recipes and uh, to share whatever they were cooking. And the, the thought was that I, I just, I had learned from this bootcamp to do a lot of research and to work on MVP before uh, actually starting a business. Because while we decide to buy a phone, we do a lot of research. We right. look at prices in US, prices in India, we compare it with the prices in Nepal, then we ask for a relative from US who is traveling to Nepal to finally get the phone. Yeah, right. When there's so much of research done to just buy a phone, there should be a good research done before starting a business. So the community was started with me adding two, 200 or 300 of my friends uh, to the particular group and uh, slowly sharing whatever we had uh, available at home, whatever was cooking. Mm. And the sole purpose was not to sell, but to validate the fact that people would want to share on what they were cooking or their recipes online. Because this particular time was where people used Instagram just to take pictures of food at restaurants and, right. <laughs> and, and tell people that they were eating something. So what people were going to share it on Facebook to tell people what they're cooking. Mm-hmm. And slowly in three or four months, we saw the growth of group from 300 people to 3,000 people. We had 20, 30, 50, 70 active posts every day where people used to share what they were cooking at home, be it a mutton curry, be it a biryani, be it a different variety of experiment they were doing. Mm-hmm. So this validated the fact that people do cook different, innovative, different, everyone has their speciality and they would right. want to share it on social <laughs> media. And finally, after doing that particular experiment on Facebook, uh, I we, we started a Facebook group called Food Mario. Right. And finally, we had confirmed the name that we want to have the name for this company as Food Mario. And uh, a group started where I requested a friend's mom to start uh, to start it as an experiment. And we had a limited menu of five or six meals that she would want to cook. And uh, I called a couple of my friends who would want to uh, try it out. And this is how it all began. And slowly we just uh, went from that Facebook group to a decent, very small WordPress website and to find to app and uh, to hundreds of cooks eventually. So that was a gradual evolution, right? And you started the concept of work from home before the whole (laughs) COVID-19 happened in Nepal. So (laughs) you were truly ahead of time again, right? So Ahead of COVID. (laughs) Ahead of COVID, of course, right? And uh, I I think like this is really fascinating because you are connecting really interesting dots here, right? Like for 30, 40 years, like people had been cooking and at the same time they were sitting at home and... uh, they were dependent on other family member for income, right? Yeah. At the same time, from the demand side, like people wanted something really hygienic meal with a couple of press or, you know, like a couple of taps so that, you know, they can enjoy some food which is prepared by someone with love and care, right? So, sure. Uh, how did it go like in the first three months here, uh, in, in the next one year? Like, how was it like? Yeah, I, I mean, I, just to come out, uh, of that Facebook group and started a website. It took us almost six months to validate the entire idea mm-hmm. of we want to do it. And for us, I think uh, first three months were very difficult. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, the first couple of weeks or a month of progress you see uh, from two meals to four, four to eight, eight to 16, and you tend to think that this is never gonna stop. All this right. is just gonna grow. But there comes a point where uh, you're stuck with a number. You can try so much, you can uh, you can think around it. Everything is working perfectly right, but the meal wouldn't cross the wouldn't cross cross fifty as a number. This is where you would want to 
now think about what is going wrong maybe the uh, the product isn't market fit yet and you tend to experiment so first three months i would say it took us three months to get 25 30 orders a day right and this this was where we were stuck and we were trying to figure out how to scale up, uh, scale up from this 30 as a number mm -hmm. and then we tried uh, experimenting with home cooks uh, trying different mechanisms for delivery uh, reducing delivery time from two hours to one hour mm -hmm. and uh, eventually uh, it worked out and finally we had reached to a number of 50 mm -hmm. after six months and this is again then you again start you again experiment you again try things it doesn't work out then you again try things it works out and you finally reach to a number 70. so in a first year i think it was uh, substantially not much of a growth as in numbers but the learning was a lot Absolutely. we had learned a lot in terms of logistics delivery uh, what our customer wanted, how our home cooks behaved, how they cooked, uh, why it was difficult for them to cook so quickly, or uh, were we over-promising our customers, um, how the food would vary from the same cooks every day. So it was a big learning. So I would say even if the numbers weren't working as we planned, but it was a very good exponential learning curve for us. Right. So since we are talking around sharing economy, right, because yeah. uh, this is where anyone can cook, anyone can eat. Right. Yeah. And uh, it, it is same with Hamra Bazaar as well. Right. True. Like, uh, Hamra Bazaar, like for our non-native uh, listener, it's like our bazaar or the, our market, which started in those classic era or when we had like this style of Internet and everything. And now people can buy anything, sell anything. So this is pretty cool. So uh, like we are always fascinated about this whole thing that happened after 2000, right? Like about the sharing economy where people can share. Now, like we are pretty comfortable, like taking a ride with a complete stranger based on like a couple of stars. Basically, it's the same with like food. We just can order food from anyone and we feel comfortable. So what do you see about uh, the sharing economy like trend in Nepal, like uh, in the last five, six years, like especially after the mobile phone boom, especially the smartphone boom? Yeah, I think if, if we look how uh, Nepal has been adopting to this um, and if we compare it to globally, how gig economy has actually mm -hmm. uh, come across, um, I think it all started in mid 2005, 2005, 2006, 2008. Right. Uh, we had we saw Uber in the US. We Airbnb was being built at the time. This was where people realized that the resources that they had had a different level of potential than they thought, and the same thing could be utilized to make a lot of capital resources that they wanted. Right. And in Nepal's case, I think. Uh, we finally had this penetration of internet that we wanted. Uh, data was much cheaper than before. Uh, the access to Android phones was easily handed over to a lot of uh, people in, in Nepal. And this brought into a new era of where people wanted to work by themselves and, and not rely upon traditional jobs. With, with Hamra Bazaar, if you look at how Hamra Bazaar started in 2005, uh, this was based on a problem that the founder faced. Uh, I just had this conversation before, like before we, uh, I got up, uh, got uh, to work as a CEO for Hammer Bazaar. I was having this conversation with the founder, and he said, uh, as he came back from uh, abroad, I was studying. He wanted to sell his mobile phone. He went to New Road, right? And uh, at the that point of time, the only way you could sell your phone was to either your friends, families, or you had to go to a New Road, and there was a shop, and you would want to ask right. him that. Would you want to buy this phone? And most likely, I think the uh, I could be wrong with the figure, but he said that he bought that phone for I think six or seven thousand rupees. He uh, he had used the phone for uh, three four months. He went to this uh, shop and said that he wanted to sell this. The person said that you have to leave the phone in the uh, shop for a few days for the customers to come in, and the price would be two thousand or twenty five hundred, which he's gonna get. Wow. So this is when he realized that maybe it's time for him to start a platform, a classified place where people don't have to travel to New Road. They don't have to wait for a customer to arrive for until uh, his phone is sold and he would get, get a fair price. And this is how Hammer Bazaar started. And that particular concept, I think, even globally, if you look at it, uh, I'm, I'm very sure there were few players, but not 
a lot of them right and these people were basically connecting sellers to buyers with as thin of as a layer that they can be and uh, this is how the journey began it started with electronics eventually the founders added automobile real estate and eventually our 22 24 different categories uh, within hammer bazaar so the journey of uh, gig economy i would say uh, had started in early 2000s itself uh, in nepal mm-hmm. and uh, looking at last 5 years on how we have seen the growth with right sharing with a lot of e-commerce um, marketplace even facebook going to marketplace mm-hmm. and uh, it seems like there's there's a there is growth in folds that we see every year and it's going to be carried on for another 5 years uh because uh it just seems like key the, the the internet penetration that we have even right now the access to internet the the data prices everything has to work towards how the neighboring countries are working if we, if you look at how jio bought in a big revolution in india, india. Mm-hmm. and this is how a lot of internet startups got a big boom mm-hmm. uh, maybe we are still to have that but in couple of years or 3 years time we'll definitely have it and with that coming in a lot of such companies that provide a platform or work as a intermediaries only are going to boom up be it e-commerce be it riding economy riding uh, ride sharing or uh, companies like ours right uh, <clears throat> so the gig economy is here to stay and it yeah. is going to be much bigger you know like uh, for developing countries like nepal or bangladesh or like uh, some of the african countries you know like jobs are really important to get people out of the poverty line and uh, there's a massive potential from these gig economies because uh, whenever i talk to some of the young people when i take a ride then they say like this has really helped them to pay the college fees or uh, you know like uh, after work they just want to get additional income so they are taking those rides so how like from your first and experience because we are just like from the receiving side right like you guys are looking for the demand side and the supply side as well like how these kind of sharing platform or uh the gig economy is going to address this really big challenge of poverty unemployment and youth engagement and those those kind of bits i think with the best thing about uh gig economy is that it somehow involves a lot of youngsters into it right uh, these people are early adopters to such technologies uh, they want to work by themselves and even if there was a time when they relied upon the income of their maybe parents or some guardian mm-hmm. uh, for their college fees or something else now they have finally started to earn by themselves and this for developing countries like ours be it be it Nepal, Bangladesh or similar countries. Uh I think it's a challenge for us to keep up to their expectation as a technology uh to provide a better service, quicker service, uh different facilities to cater to almost all the uh community, bring in a lot of jobs. And if we if we look at Nepal, there there's been lacks of jobs I would say that has been created with uh Tootle with Patao with um uh, people selling on hamra bazaar uh with people trying to set up only cloud kitchens uh through food tech companies uh so this has eventually become a very popular uh place where people see it as a mainstream job for them and it has brought in a big amount of i think that eventually is going to give a big impact on the gdp as well right and uh the only thing is that with the with the growing economy on uh, with the growing gig economy a lot of regulations that need to be followed are still to become right uh, uh, from the government side or maybe uh, uh, from us as well where we want to self regulate ourselves with uh, what's safer for the people what's not safe for people what we should do to improve the quality of the service or uh, uh, different things but eventually i think this is this is one place where country like ours is going to be very much dependent to create a lot of jobs very quickly so i think it's a positive move for us to move towards sharing economy right uh, you say like the stuff around regulation right like yeah. when we we see new innovation that the innovation are ahead of the existing laws policies and stuff so how like laws or the policies are 
becoming enabler for a company like yours or has it been more challenging for you to sure. sometime you know like educate the bureaucrats educate the you know like policy makers like this is what we are doing right because i remember like one of the story behind uh, like we do something around like blockchain technology especially asset or the commodity transfer during the time of crisis so at one point of time there was understanding that oh you guys are mining mm-hmm. bitcoins right so we have to be so simpler yeah. to tell them like okay this is like blockchain is like worldwide wave and maybe bitcoin is like paypal yeah. and we are not paypal right so True. because uh, as an innovator like someone who does things for the first time right like we sometimes tend to be very complex and uh, that's why we always say like uh, sometime we our marketing message is more like we're talking to engineers but we yeah. want to talk to like the people who understand the plain language so tell us your experience around you know like dealing with those kind of challenges or opportunities and how was that experience like yeah i think in the case of regulation in nepal um a uh, it bill is about to be passed i think mm-hmm. uh, we we just had a conversation with the ministry a couple of days back uh the few things that come as a challenge when the regulations are not there and uh, i think the good things as well uh but the point is that even if government is interested to regulate e-commerce the intentions have to be to facilitate e-commerce on how it can grow right but i think the intention towards them is that the e-commerce sex sex the particular segment of e-commerce has been growing too quick and uh, they would want to regulate them so customers can have all the benefits and this is because uh, 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 i do understand that a lot of e-commerce companies or uh, instagram companies or facebook companies uh, don't follow the regulations and customers uh, internal regulations and customers seem like they have been scammed right so the intentions intentions from the government has to be in a way that they would want to facilitate rather than to uh just regulate it so uh we were just having this conversation where they wanted to finally bring in a intermediary law and we had been lobbying for this since last i don't know many years 3 4 years we have been talking about this but the 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 intention of e-commerce to bring it was to substantially bring less of a hassle to the commerce companies who were just facilitating uh a place for people to sell their goods but it just seems like the understanding of government is just opposite to that right and uh, although they do understand that they want e-commerce to grow a lot of countries have seen big chunk of 20% 30% even 40% of their gdp contributed through e-commerce online commerce but they just seem to have this uh, thought that e-commerce is here to maybe milk out a lot of cash through customers and not provide sufficient service maybe this is what they need to change and if they have this pro- thought process of what they have on regulating e-commerce being changed finally the uh, online uh, uh, the e-commerce bill which is going to come out is going to be a regulatory factor that would bring in a lot of fdis is going to uh, give a good good uh, push to e-commerce existing e-commerce companies as well so uh, they do have understanding but uh maybe they need to deeply uh, think around how e-commerce has been adopted in the neighboring countries maybe how in evolved economy where the gdp has been contributed 30% through e-commerce how they have been regulating e-commerce and if it done so finally a good bill would be passed and this is going to help a lot of e-commerce e-commerce companies in nepal as well right i i think there are like so many exciting things that are going to happen yeah. and uh it, it is great like uh e-commerce companies themselves are pushing for regulation which makes it more enabling condition because you know like big brands of course they are like self regulating themselves and they want to protect the consumer rights as well so this is great because right now we are seeing you know like a lot of sellers in like uh, selling informally let's say in facebook yeah. or instagram right and uh, it's always funny like people are pull, like posting saying like pp or the price please is kind of a basic yeah. uh, thing what is happening so uh, you have to deposit the money you don't know the seller whether yeah. they're registered or not so these are some of the challenges uh, the big companies like yours are trying to address by lobbying the government i think that this is really great to establish the amount of trust 
right? Yeah. Because uh, at the end of the day, that trust is something that really matters in business. So uh, this is fantastic. So since we are talking quite a lot around emerging technologies and how entrepreneur like yourself has been tapping into those uh, emerging technologies, right now, if we don't talk about uh, some of the emerging technologies like AI and then big data, then I think this conversation will not be uh, more intense, let's sure. put it that way. And I, I, like well, when we look into like the industrial revolution, right? So first, second, and third really helped uh, the global north in terms of producing, in terms of being a leader in uh, like creating social value as well as the capital. But now when we look into the fourth industrial revolution, which we have been seeing, especially after the internet boom, mm. then this is where like anyone can become a unicorn company by just sitting in the laptop, you know, with a decent internet connection, right? And now we're talking about artificial intelligence. Like uh, the other day I was reading something around, you know, like uh, the AI even produced a formulae or like some chemical thing where, you know, the plastic itself eats itself or something like that. So that can solve the issue of microplastics. So how do you see the trend of uh, AI and how that can be a really powerful tool to solve some of the pressing issues related to education in country like Nepal or emerging countries or health and nutrition issues or something related to entrepreneurship or yeah. unemployment? I think for uh, the good thing about countries like us is that we finally have enough of, I think, uh, uh, people who know how to code and work on data, uh, create algorithms, work around it. <clears throat> so I think for, for us to foster it, at first, I think the steps from if we, if we look at around education, the first thing that we need to do, that I'm very sure a lot of companies are doing, mm -hmm. is to first digitalize whatever they know right. and digitalize things that can be analyzed eventually. And somehow, finally, if we have enough data, we can work on ML to provide good enough analysis on how we have evolved till now, and this is where we are going. Mm -hmm. And to have that information with thousands and lakhs of students that we have right now can actually help economic like us to know where the future is. Right. If you look at for the commerce, the importance of data to be used rightly, uh, the privacy issues to be catered rightly through government, through IT bills. Right. And for us to assure that with so many choices on internet, with uh, lakhs of lakhs of products, with thousands and thousands of sellers, uh, to bring in what the customers want easily to them within the confinement of six inch screens that they are browsing through is something very important. This just saves a lot of effort, time of consumers to browse stuffs on internet. And with data and analyzing it, it just makes the process much faster, easier for people to use. I, I do see a lot of companies working towards it. I think uh, a lot of, uh, uh, I think banking is soon going to see a lot of uh, uh, loans being passed through these credit scores, which have been uh, accumulated through them uh, in last so many years and been processed through a algorithm that companies are making uh, to assure it's a safe loan to have less credit risks. And uh, I think all the sectors are seeing a, uh, change of itself the the computation that was so uh, difficult in uh, if you look at five years six years back had to be done through so many people uh, the resources that the company would need has been simplified by 100 times 200 times 300 times and uh, whatever would uh, would just take seven or ten days to be done now is done in a minute or two so it, it just seems like we are moving towards it uh, but a lot of Nepali companies need to understand and to uh, and to get the talent to have them uh, has been very difficult because a lot of good talents are there. We do have a lot of IT resources, but all of these companies are working for companies outside of Nepal because they have already seen this happening in their part of the world. So it's important for us. I think we're working towards it as well. A lot of companies are working on it. Uh, we will definitely see a lot of changes and importance of being uh, importance of data for businesses and uh, definitely with this we need uh, a good regulations from government side as well 
for uh, them to see that the data is not misutilized and what the misutilization of data can do uh, for customers. So uh, I think uh, we'll see something really good in the next couple of years with data and uh, AI. Absolutely, because uh, we're talking about AI, which is a very tricky subject as well, right? Yeah. Because we are empowering the machine and harnessing sure. their intelligence. The other day I was uh, watching this video around, you know, like how AI can draw anything, right? <coughs> so I was thinking, wow, this is pretty cool, right? For example, I'm a terrible artist. So for me, like I can just add something and it can make anything, right? But at the same time, what about those creative people? So there, there, there are a lot of debate what is happening around the ethics, especially when you talk about that. I think the major one was self-driving car. That's how it started, right? Like okay. how to see things. And that's where the classic uh, uh, the, the, the trolley experiment comes in as well. Okay. So uh, this is quite interesting. And I think like uh, there needs to be, as you said, uh, really important to talk about the policy level enabling bits at the same time, like uh, formulating something which really helps us to become more ethical when we are trying something pretty cool and promising technologies. Uh, uh, anything really interesting what you're seeing right now in the space of tech, in the space of innovation, in the space of how uh, these are really helping, like, let's say, you know, like people who are less fortunate uh, or who are living below the poverty line in Nepal or similar countries? I think the use of data for uh, education to know uh, all the districts are uh, where the education has been f flourishing or not, mm -hmm. uh, how the education system has worked there, how many people, how many students have migrated from that place to different places, how they are performing. Uh, to bring in a pattern that would finally uh, give an understanding of what's needed in that place can be helpful. I don't know if uh, there are companies working towards it. I'm pretty sure they are. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, with farmers, a lot of tech, uh, a lot of predictions with uh, the harvesting, with the analysis of how the soil has been evolved over the time. Uh, a lot of these resources have been mobilized towards farming right. and uh, access to all this information for farmers are very important. And I do, I don't exactly know uh, the company names. Maybe I forgot. I, I've heard about companies who have been working towards it to provide access to uh, farmers with information on when they should harvest their farm, uh, they, uh, what they have planted, or um, how the weather is going to be in their favors or not. And this is definitely helping them with uh, coming out of the uh, the problems that they face before uh, getting access to data. Right. Uh, like we, we had been talking with one of our tech partner called uh, Prixa Technologies. Like they support us quite a lot with, a lot with uh, blockchain technologies. But at the same time, they're experimenting something around uh, a micro sensor in Swell, right? In, uh, I, I think it's province five or the uh, Lumbini province where uh, they are working with the local governments to install those facilities and uh, they take all the data around, you know, like uh, geography, the soil stuff, you know, all the rainfall and stuff. And then they tell farmer like what to, you know, like uh, harvest or like what to basically plant and when yeah. to irrigate and those things. And they were sharing this uh, statistics around like, you know, like uh, year on year, that, like the farmers saw 30 percent rise in productivity. And that's where I was like, wow, this is something where the power of AI is like you continuously feed those information and they analyze and they become much more smarter. True. So uh, a lot of exciting things are definitely going to happen around it. Uh, you know, like I just wanted to talk about since we are talking about the emerging technologies and uh, we started with your journey and so many things we have uh, talked so far. Uh, let's talk about failure. This is one of the favorite topics because I've failed so many times in my life as well. Like I tried to be an entrepreneur. And I felt, I must say, terribly. But I, I, I'm really glad that it felt, you know, because uh, I learned so much from the process. I wanted to be in fintech at one point of time uh, back in 2017, you know, like with the whole dream of revolution, like shaking the industry and, you know, like coming up with the credit scoring, you know, like making all this swipe thing easy and all the cool thing, right? 
Uh, and then I realized like maybe I was ahead of time, maybe I didn't do enough, but you know, like those were really powerful learning for me. Even still, I refer to some of those things because they were some of the amazing topic I was passionate about. So in like Southern world, or let's say, especially in uh, South Asia, you know, like uh, people don't really talk about failure, right? Uh, because uh, failure is something that is perceived as you are weak you have got some fault and people are not open to talk about failure until and unless you become super successful and you want to share your inspiring stories that's how it works so how do you see like failure and entrepreneurship yes like people like yourself has been learning quite a lot from the process it has been iterative and you have ended becoming really uh, successful in this avenue but at the same time there are like many people who have failed and then they just quit right uh, there, there, there's always this uh, joke we crack upon like uh, young people rather like they are really passionate they want to become an entrepreneur if you go to any business students then they say I want to be an entrepreneur and once they fail they go to Australia <laughs> right so that's the joke we always make around so how do you see like uh, the perception around failure has been is it changing or like how people are digesting the whole issue of failure I think, yeah, eventually, uh, if you look at how uh, people have started perceiving failures as um, has changed eventually. I think uh, today, if you talk about failures, people do understand that maybe at least the person try, definitely has learned a lot. Uh, if you look at our pattern of recruitment as well, when we hire people, if we see the person has tried their own company, has worked for the particular product for a year or two, uh, we want them maybe more than anyone else because uh, we do understand what comes with failure. There, there are a lot of things that they were involved in. There is a there is a leadership skill that they have eventually gotten into. Uh, there is a deep understanding of what they were doing, how they failed, and this brings in the kind of uh, skills that usually people don't get if they don't start. Right. And so people have started taking failures positively. Uh, but uh, I think if if you look at uh, not every failure is good if you don't learn. Right. So even if the understanding of failure has to uh, it has to be in a way that people learn from their mistakes. And if I, if I look at my first few three four uh, uh, informal uh, businesses or uh, something that I wanted to do while I was in college. I learned to fail, uh, I learned to st study my failure and uh, this is, uh, this brings in a different kind of trouble, you again fail with the same mistake. So when I started my first company, I knew that I wasn't very good with uh, managing cash flow and uh, getting, uh, writing records of my transactions and I didn't learn it in my last two, three failures, I didn't learn it with my solar company. I eventually had to again feel with my uh, goat farming that I did uh, with the same thing. So the important thing is uh, people do fail. Obviously, when they try, the possibility of failure is always high. But every time the person should fail, they should tend to learn from everything. So they don't repeat it over and over again, at least not in the short period of time. And uh, so even the understanding on how to document things, uh, why to document things. So because you cannot remember everything right. as you start a business and the importance of documentation is when you look back in time, you look at the records. Now you finally know that, oh, what I tried a couple of years back, this is because we failed or this is where we failed. This is where the failure started and not to reflect the same thing back in the other company. So there is a process to how to learn as well. And to figure out the process and to grab everything out of the failure is very important when you fail. Absolutely. That's why we say like fail fast, learn fast, right? Yeah. Uh, that, that's why like when we say like, uh, I, I think like we are blessed to be in this innovation space where we are funded to fail and learn from yes. the process, right? Yes. And we say like, but at the same time, you have to be really, really accountable of what you are doing, True. right? So that's why like uh, normally people say, oh, innovation fails and you learn, but you know, like, 
we don't tend to really learn. So this is something we are yes. trying to learn from other colleagues as well, because instead of making thousand mistakes, we can learn from hundred mistakes made by others, right? So, True. Uh, this is something we are working on as well. Uh, you know, like we are having really interesting conversation now. Like I would like to move more around like private sector like yourself because we are more into the humanitarian sector. So our main mandate is all around creating social value, especially creating impact for the people who are vulnerable, right? This is where, like if, we look, if I look from the entrepreneurial perspective, then I don't see financial motive to get into these categories, right? Yeah. So, but at the same time, the private sectors are like generating jobs, creating more vibrant economy, right? So we talk a different language. For example, you guys say customers, we say beneficiaries, right? Yeah. We have got different jargons and I'm sure like the, for example, MVP first is most vulnerable people. For you, it's like minimum viable product, <laughs> right? So we speak different things, but at the same time, we really, really think that uh, private sectors are there to sustain. So if we do something and in order to make sure that uh, it goes long term, we need to partner with the private sector. And also it's all about agility, efficiency, and all the cool innovation that is happening. So what can uh, humanitarian sectors learn from like cool, innovative company like yours or you know, from uh, private sector? I think the the one thing that uh, that has come across my mind uh, that is private companies that the, the biggest focus for us when we start a company is the sustainability mm -hmm. to bring out a product which is uh, profitable but at the same time we can use those profit to sustain our growth and eventually if you look at most of the tech startups globally mm -hmm. uh, most of them actually don't make profit. Right. These are like running uh, in no profits for years and years. And this is to fuel their growth and still be sustainable. And to figure out the right unit, unit economics for uh, the particular model or the product or services they're offering. So maybe uh, different uh, organizations like yours can work upon how keeping in mind how to work very leanly to uh, make sure that you're spending as less as possible to get the highest output. Mm -hmm. So the sustainability of your uh, organization, if was expected with a particular cast to be for six months, now it's eight months. Right. And this is how startups usually work. So maybe this is one thing that uh, organizations can actually learn on how to increase the runway for you as well. Perfect, because there's a thing called value for money, right? True. So the more you become prudent, at the same time, not compromising with the quality you deliver, that's something definitely uh, we want to learn. Since, you know, this podcast is around, like we talk about the innovation in global south, rather than like all the usual things that's happening in Silicon Valley, or let's say in London or in Frankfurt, right? And uh, do you have any message for our listener, like beyond Nepal, who are really particularly interested around like all the cool innovation happening in the global south uh, yeah. because of the internet, because of all these amazing things that's happening right now? Yeah, I think uh, in the sense of innovation or how we cater to the creativity, uh, I think it's as equal as to West. Um, the kind of startups that we see uh, in Silicon Valley uh, are as as innovative as the kind of companies that we see in Nepal or the countries that we have, neighboring countries as well. And there is no difference between how people can think. Mm -hmm. The only difference is the kind of resources or uh, the initial investment or the kind of runway they get or as we get. But we are eventually making up to it as well. Right. Uh, we, we see a lot of VCs coming in. We see a lot of um, uh, angel investment happening. Uh, I see a lot of uh, tech-based startups in Silicon Valley, Valley finally uh, giving outsourcing a lot of tech things to us to work from, from India, from Nepal, from Bangladesh. And the best thing is that the tech resources that we have right now in, in our subcontinent is working, I think, in half of the price of what you get in Silicon Valley. Right. And as startups, as we talked earlier, uh, 
our our thing is to assure that we have a higher runway so even if we get half of the investment then to be have a with the startup that we have in silicon valley we still are as sustainable and we have enough runway so maybe it's time for the global uh, vcs and global people angel investments to seek for opportunities in our subcontinent to see how we are growing with the internet with the population with the young set of people that we have here so uh, i think we are we are almost there in in next 5 years we'll see a big revolution happening from this side of the world so a lot of things yeah. are going to happen especially a lot of innovation a lot of disruption challenges in the status quo and all these kind of things i think this is really really amazing uh, conversation we had uh, yeah. it's it's an absolute uh, pleasure to have you yeah. here learn from the process and uh, it's always inspiring to you know like meet some of the uh, cool innovators cool entrepreneur like yourself thank you for all the great and amazing thing you have been doing for uh, you know like all the msmes all the sellers all the buyers and everything uh, lovely to have you in the show thank you thank you so much for inviting me and it was a pleasure talking to you thank you thank you